In a world of big mouths and empty shells Fully loaded mansions with empty shelves Your words and actions were genuine, the people could tell Broke down doors, you never cease to excel So la lula, damn man, I wish I met you sooner Theories on point, bro, you was a sharpshooter Human is bold, humorous In a world so cold, grip the sell out for a bag of gold Majority report, where you molded your thoughts on TMBS, you would talk that talk Always kind, looking out for the underdog Fought for workers, every day, punching the card You a star legend, an icon for us We gon' fight for what's just You keep the light on us, from flesh to stardust We blessed to know you, dude Every day you serve dust with some good soul food International, cosmopolitan You left so abruptly, it's hard to process it Man, we shook as ever P.S. Thanks for the book, it's Michael Brooks forever Guys, stay safe, stay well Be kind to yourselves and others And also realize that that effort starts over each day So watch TMBS Chop it up with Cornell West And I say, man, I'm gonna miss Michael And yeah, the grief, it stinks Open your heart and sing Rest in peace, King Did I not? Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the memorial show of the one year of Michael Brooks's passing. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep this pretty brief because I want to jump into everyone's stories and testimonials and, and videos that they sent in. Uh, but, but first, I just need to thank everyone who has reached out, um, not just this week or this month or, or last summer, but I don't think a single day went by where I didn't hear from someone. And um, I really don't have words for, for how grateful I am to have had that much support. I can't, I can't imagine reliving any day again this past year, but I also can't imagine having done it without just the, the tremendous outpouring of love. Um, it, it feels very significant that so many people are sharing this grief and, um, I don't know, it, it, it really, it means so much to me. It feels like so many people on earth have continued to say Michael's name and share his work and learn from him. And, um, I, I think that that would have been in some ways kind of like bigger than Michael's wildest dreams to, to, I hope he feels this impact. Um, I apologize if the audio and video quality at times isn't so great. Um, people sent in videos from all around the world, and I've been editing and recording while I've been on a road trip across um, fairly rural parts of America. So internet has been <laughs> a little bit of a, of a rocky journey. So um, just, just know that up front. They're, they're, hopefully, maybe one day we can remaster this. But for tonight, it just is what it is. And I'm, I'm sorry, you might be doing a lot of volume up and volume down. Uh, for those of you who um, are tuning in and want to get to know more about Michael the person and uh, his story on the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash TMBS, I've been working on, um, I think I just released the 16th or 17th episode of The Brief and Wondrous Life of Michael Brooks, where I talk to folks about um, his life, their, their friendships with him, uh, different stories. So um, definitely check that out. I think over the course of this year, it's become very obvious that Michael's work will live on and it will continue to impact and educate people. But also um, in his passing, there's become sort of like, a, you know, deification and, and saint-like quality. And I, I do want to remind people and the reason I've been working on The Brief and Wondrous Life and I want to make a documentary is that Michael was so, so very much a human. And that was at the core of his project was just filling in and seeing the human qualities in, in each other and all of us. And he grew and learned and continued to learn. So I just want to um, encourage everyone to, to like, you have the tools and the, you have what it takes to grow and, and learn the way Michael did. And so that's part of um, the intention behind the legacy work. So I'm going to sign off. It is um, very surreal that, that Michael passed away a year ago. I, I still really 
don't believe it. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking of all of you, I, I know so many people have lost people, um, you know, this year and the year before. So thinking about you and, and, and your loved ones as well. Love and solidarity. Thank you all for, for sending in your videos and emails. If I, if I didn't get your email or your video, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be working through and, and trying to reply to everyone. But um, I apologize if it slipped between the cracks. Maybe um, send it to me again because I really would love to see it. All right. Enjoy the show. Thank you. All right. So um, hello, everyone. Hello, Alicia. Um, I hope you're doing well, you and your family. Um, today, I'm doing this video to highlight three main things um, that I personally think it's important. Uh, first of all, my name is Iyad and I'm from Palestine, Gaza. And the three points I want to highlight. First thing is, um, I want people to know the extent of Michael's uh, message, the extent of its reach, that it did reach somebody like me living thousands of miles away. And um, we obviously, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to be the first one to say it, but his work was um, originated from from love and compassion towards others, and um, I think that's why it was so easy for me to feel um, um, to connect with Michael. You felt like you're included. You felt like you um, like you felt global. You honestly felt global. Like there is no borders. There is no religion. There is no. Um, language barriers between between us when he talks about Palestine f from his perspective at least he talks about um, uh, Brazil um, India anything else anything else he, he tackled um, you sense that there is no there is no there, there is nothing differentiating him from the people he's talking about when talking about their suffering. I have to be honest, and this is something really inspiring and beautiful about Michael's work. I think that's why um, it resonated with somebody like me. I'm not sure if I used resonated correctly. <laughs> but that's why it grabbed my attention. And that's why I love it. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is I think also is in, um, important for people to know um, is that Michael personally has affected my life um, in a very positive way where I I got to know um, other pe other fans of Michael. Um, I got to know um, a Spanish journalist. Her name is Tierra, and we became very close friends. Um, it also happens through your Instagram, Lisha. But, I mean, we connected because we love Michael. And she introduced me to one of her best friends, and I did the same thing, and we became four people. Um, 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 Spain, Pakistan, Sweden, and Palestine. And we would talk um, very often, and we'd talk about things, politics, life, anything that could come up. Yeah, we became friends, basically. And I think that's something so unique, so beautiful. Um, and that's why... For somebody like me, I I would celebrate Michael's um, it makes me it makes me celebrate Michael, really, honestly. And be thankful, at least for everything that he has done. Um, and miss him obviously so much. No doubt, no doubt. The third thing and the last thing I want to talk about is um, um um, I hope, Leisha, that in all of this, in this video and the, and the hundreds of videos of fans and the projects that you're doing for Michael in his name, that brings you peace and that, you know, I know you're proud, but be prouder as well of your brother that, you know, um, you can see the effects ongoing of his work and his vision. I want to end with this. Thank you so much, Lisha. Um, you're doing amazing. We love you so much. We're proud of you, and I'm sure Michael loves you and is proud of you as well. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. This is James from Sydney here. Uh, Long-time super fan boy of Michael Brooks. Uh, 
bit embarrassing to say that a man of my age but what the hell there's not much going on here in Sydney Australia so uh, I thought why not and I became uh, I became hooked on everything Michael said and did for about three or four years and obviously I miss him greatly um, how has he influenced me and how does he continue to influence me I guess uh, one of the big ones raising up international issues uh, you know, teaching me how connected all those international struggles are. And that's led me to get involved with um, uh, local actions on behalf of and in solidarity with Palestinian people, Latin American and Cuban people, and uh, deepen my involvement with the fight for recognition of our local indigenous people. Um, the amazing reading material that uh, Michael referred me to and the list that Leisha put together uh, when Michael passed has uh, really kind of uh, changed my brain in good ways forever. Um, I've deepened my spiritual practice. I'm a long-term, uh, long-time Buddhist meditator. Um, and uh, as anyone who does that knows, your, your commitment to it waxes and wanes, but certainly um, inspired by Michael's background and his message, um, I've, I've deepened my practice. And I'm trying to fuse that practice, that spiritual uh, practice with my outward political activities and trying to create something new, a new way to engage with the world by fusing those two most important strands of my life. Um, and, and that's all thanks to Michael. But the main thing Michael did for me was to, to make it cool, um, to show us how to be confident to be leftists. Um, to you know teach us that you know if we're going if we're going to go out in the world and try and change it for the better to be confident be funny uh be angry when we need to um step forward and just uh you know know that you're doing the right thing and and, and have confidence in that and um, that's really helped me enormously um because you know a lot of times uh having a a leftist political perspective particularly in australia uh, you feel like you're the one in a million and you know you'll never meet anyone else who um who thinks the way you do but once you start to speak with with confidence and um you bring a real humanity and, and life to your message um it's amazing the amount of people come out of the woodwork and gravitate to what you're saying and, and that's how you build communities and and that's what michael's done for me and i miss him greatly um Obviously, I never knew the guy, so it's not the kind of relationship that some of the rest of you had, but um, I miss him greatly, and um, his message uh, lives with me forever. And uh, let's keep fighting the good fight, everyone. Thanks. I live in Valencia in Spain, originally from Israel. Well, as I wrote to you in the email, it's quite quite complicated to explain, especially because, obviously, I didn't know your brother, not personally. Um, but, um, I remember that the day, you know, the, because obviously because of the time, time difference to me, it was uh, July 21st and just came home from, you know, a walk in the morning and I scrolled through Twitter and suddenly I see the, the picture that, uh, MR put on their Twitter. And I was like, I, I was reading through it and I was like, as long, like, you know, as I was going through the text, I was like, this is a joke, right? Like, what do you mean? You know? And I saw, you know, his stream just. The day, two days before that and as it would as the week passed by i realized i was mourning you know and i felt like why like I, I i never met him i didn't know him like he was a personal friend but as as the week as the week passed by and i um Listen to obviously first the majority report show where first I saw you coming on because um, Michael uh, talked a little bit about you know his past but he didn't talk about the people in his um, in his personal life right which a lot of YouTubers uh, tend to do right to keep their personal life personal and so I watched the MR show and other uh, tributes and I realized I I got to get a little bit um i got more information about him right and what kind of person he was and um outside you know the persona that we see online and i was in awe you know of his what i what i perceived as his dedication and and focus more than anything you know like this is what i need to do this is how i should do it right to produce for example good content or um, bringing people together, right, in order to 
not just be, you know, funny and witty and smart on YouTube, but actually create a movement that can bring about change. And um, from what everyone says about, you know, his overwhelming compassion for people, right? And trying not to, not to judging, not to judge people too much, right? And his now very famous quote, you know, uh, to be harsh with systems and um, uh, be, um, I, I, I keep forgetting their direct pro, but be compassionate with people. And after that, in the month that followed, I realized that I was just trying to do a lot of things, doing more and more, um, and try to also focus my time because I guess, you know, when someone, someone young dies, we try to look for meaning. And um, obviously he was not a kid, but he was very young. And, you know, at least I felt that although he, he had so much more to do and his death was, I think, devastating for all of us because, because of the things that he could have done, right? And, they, and yet at the same time, he accomplished so much, you know? So I guess it was uh, inspiring for me. So um, I, I will not dare to say <laughs> that I'm anything like Michael, um, but I, I, do, I did try for a while to take on more things um, and to um, try to implement that saying of being compassionate with people as much as I can. And also try to, when I talk to people who are not from my field, to try to meet them where they are. Yeah. Uh, more than anything, I think your brother inspired me to try and find those connections, right? And always look for opportunities. Hello, my name is Jay Zacharias. I'm 23 years old and I'm calling in from New York City in some borough somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So I got into your brother's work around mid to late 2016 i think it was a clip of him roasting the shit out of alex jones um when he was being harassed by this crazy fan of his um with uh, another despicable person milo yannapolis and i remember just thinking wow who the fuck is this really like funny irreverent guy just like really hitting all the sensical points about like why this is also really funny, but why Alex Jones is a disgusting person. Um, and I feel like the majority port too, I should add, was like always in the periphery for me. Like I always had an awareness of who they were because I'd saw, I had seen some uh, clips of them talking about like Matt Lauer and all this other big stuff that now has like 2 million, 5 million views, which is crazy to think about. Um, but like around the time that, you know, the uh, game show asshole got elected. I think things really started to pick up for me and I started taking a uh, majority report a lot, a lot more seriously. Um, and I really, really, really found Michael's perspective and his approach and his lens on things really refreshing because at that time uh, I was an undergraduate and I was like stuck in this really bizarre, expensive private institution where, you know, I had these white guys coming up to me being like, oh, so you're from Mozambique and, you know, you lived in South Africa. Uh, I have all this like great inside information on post-apartheid South Africa, but did you know that, you know, the conditions for post-apartheid South Africa actually caused all of these inequalities where reverse racism is now a thing. And I was just like, Jesus Christ. So at that point in my life, I was like really allergic to people just coming up to me and be like, Hey, you're from Africa. I, I would almost like no exaggeration. You'd be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> common no, I'm not actually. <laughs> Very common misconception. No, I'm not. Just like reaching for a cross, just like trying to keep all of these people away. Sure. Um, but yeah, when I found Michael's, I was just like, oh, here's who not only knows the history, but knows it so well that he can like just make very succinct cultural references to everything. And I get it. And it's almost like I'm hanging out with a childhood best friend in a weird way. I didn't, I didn't know how to explain it, but yeah, I was just really. Another thing that really that I've been thinking about a lot recently is that he, you know, everybody is always talking about his sense of humor. And I just mentioned it, obviously. And it's like a really, really great attribute. I haven't come across too many people who aren't just funny, but are just almost human satire machines. I feel mm -hmm. like it's a very, very, very distinct group of people. And the only people that come to mind who even like broach that area in terms of like well-known people are like Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy, who like I'm obsessed with. And, you Huge know, influences know. on Michael, by the way. 
Yeah, no, I, he was talking. I know that you mentioned he was really big into Raw, but he also uh, dropped some uh, Richard Pryor references uh, here and there on TMBS. I can't recall which episodes, obviously, because it all starts to blend in together. You know, and that's a really important part of him. But really struck me is he had this great sense of humanity. You know, there are a lot of people on the online left who run podcasts who are really funny, right? Like that's the thing is to be mm -hmm. funny and irreverent. But Michael had a very, very distinct and humane approach. And it really touched me because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, he understood the history of a lot of the places where I had lived and where I was coming from, but it really validated my sense of person as well in order, you know, in, in terms of sharing information about how to approach this struggle. Mm -hmm. It really made me feel like, wow, I actually do have all of these great things in my backyard that I can contribute. And I'm not just, you know, on the end, you know, just holding up microphones for, you know, Saggio white guys. I hate to, I hate to essentialize like that, but you know, it, it really was, you know, what the shape of the online left was at that point, but he was totally. really, really broadening the wave. And now, you know, I just don't know that uh, I can't, I won't say that that won't happen again. Cause you know, it's starting to really, really, really shift. And I know that there's been a lot of hard work, you know, trying to make things more inclusive, you know, with the folks that, you know, this is revolution and, you know, a lot of really, really, really great work. Shout but out I to think this that, is revolution. Shout out to this is revolution. Great pod. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think that it's just a really, I would say that if you're somebody who's just as invested as I am in this really great body of work that Michael's left behind and now a quick little product placement shot of the, uh, book in the background oh nice <laughs> so this is stephen robbins uh i go by the moniker ronald reagan on the majority report um i wanted to share briefly my sort of uh, experience with michael um i met michael obviously through the majority report i started listening when he was still pretty new uh, he was doing a lot of branding stuff and when i started a podcast i reached out to him to to get feedback you know because I, I felt like it wasn't very good. I was right. <laughs> it wasn't very good. Um, and Michael, it started out as a paid thing. I was paying him to, you know, for his time. I knew he was underpaid by Sam. So, you know, um, but it, it was very useful. And also he was just so positive and, uh, you know, really encouraging and, um, you know, calling into the majority report was so much easier when, uh, Michael was with us because uh, his laugh was it, the audio when you call into that show is not very good and Michael so you can't really hear the responses from them very well but Michael's laugh was always such an audible cue that you were either <laughs> doing really well or not doing so well in terms of like telling a joke um, but I really um, grew to to love Michael and um, he came out here once um, when he started his show uh, initially he had looped me into um, sort of planning and some of those things and um, I could just tell my attitude was very much like you should just start because you're a genius like just start recording shows but he wanted to pump the brakes and make sure it was uh, very thoughtful and curated and, and perfect which it ultimately was um and then i don't want to go on too long but you know our relationship i feel like during the primary which now seems like ancient history but got a little bit contentious because like i liked one of the candidates more than he did <laughs> which now is like ridiculous right especially when somebody passes to think that you would spend any time arguing about any of that as if it mattered um but even in the moment when things were heated or a little bit uh there was some tension there he was always the one reaching out to me to say like hey like if let's discuss this like call me like he <laughs> he was always the one saying call me this famous guy with a huge show reaching out to some nobody saying like you know, let's not get into a fight on Twitter. Like, you can call me or send me a message. You know, we don't have to be going on like this. And um, 
I feel really lucky that he reached out to me a few days before he passed and we just, it was like a simple text exchange, but he had all these big ideas and we told some jokes and, and he was, you know, just checking in. And that was to me the thing that I'll always remember about Michael, like taking the time to reach out to me when, I mean, I, he didn't need to do that. Um, and to, you know, just check in, how are you doing? Uh, let me check your, uh, let me, um, pick your brain on something or, or whatever. Um, and always being, you know, the bigger one of the two. So, uh, I miss Michael. I think about him a lot. Um, it's, uh, a huge vacuum for I think people who who really knew him and then also I have friends who listen to the show who have said um you know who didn't know Michael at all who said that his passing has affected them more than the passing of any other you know celebrity or famous person and I think that's because that energy of like caring deeply about people um you know, he was able to communicate that even to people who he didn't know. Hi, so. my name is Tiare Gattimora. I am a journalist and a political activist from Spain and Italy. And Michael's work has deeply impacted me and quite honestly helped me so much. Um, I actually uh, found out about him later than I would have wished because I watched Jacobin's Weekends with Anna Kasparian and Michael Brooks and that's where I realized that he's someone that I could definitely understand because I had been for so long at university trying to like get this academic jargon which while helpful in many ways, is definitely not as accessible as one might wish. And Michael helped me so much to really put into context things that otherwise were not as easy to grasp um, for me. And one thing that I deeply appreciate about Michael is that he would not sanitize anybody. Um, you know, he wouldn't just um, praise someone or whitewash them because they were against the US. He actually, his analysis was very thorough, very nuanced and very intellectually honest. And that to me is so important. Um, as well as his collaborations, you know, the fact that he talked so much to people that are um, kind of my idols, like Professor Richard Wolf, um, Ben Burgess, etc. I, I just have so much admiration for, you know, for, for Michael, for his work, um, for all of these things so much so that I, I rely on, you know, him so much for my own work. I, I know I can trust him. I know when I'm doing my own research, I can go there and I'm gonna find an intellectually honest and thorough um, analysis on his part. And so his work is still um, so important to me and I know I will definitely keep uh, relying on it. And Lisha, I am so grateful that you are not only remembering his work, but even developing it this is such an important you know project and i am so grateful for it thank you so my name is Noor. i'm from uh, the united kingdom so the first time i was really conscious that i was watching a michael video was um and this is the one i started like sharing around with my friends and stuff was there was a there's a clip called um and everybody who's watching just look it up um russell brand school sam harris on every subject yeah and again, it was, I think I was listening to, um, I saw a Matt Lett clip the other day and he was talking about on Left Reckoning, um, Michael being in his final form or his kind of at the height of his powers, which is a phrase I've used, which is he had, he was able to do that kind of Hitchens thing of 
being able to speak on the fly and mm. just putting an idea together from his head into the world, which is such a difficult thing to do in a way that you almost, there was no editing to be done. Right. Um, so it was a thing where I think Harris was talking about how like people who believe in God, they don't, they don't really have an incentive to care about making things better in the world mm. and, uh, and all this kind of thing. And, the, and, and Michael straight away came in and said, well, that's nonsense because if you know anything about Islam, which is what, you know, I'm a Muslim and what Sam Harris was talking about, I can't remember who he was speaking to, talking about how, like, um, Michael said, well, if you if you know anything about Islam or a lot of the religions that kind of have an afterlife and an accountability, that almost all that matters is what you do here. Mm. It, it's just that this isn't, this is passing, you know, this is fleeting. And yes, there is hopefully something to come, but what that is like depends on what you do here. Oh, he gets it. <laughs> I, I didn't really understand whether he kind of, I tended to assume that people that I would watch online just by default wouldn't believe in God, but actually Michael did in some way, which I still need to work through some of the stuff that you've been, um, uh, the interviews that you've been doing and to really yeah. kind of understand that side of his life. But he definitely had a spiritual side, possibly even something you would describe as theistic but maybe not something you could map to any one tradition. Whereas I'm kind of, I'm a Muslim and he kind of got me. He'd spent time in Turkey, he'd read, and he just understood us as people. This guy gets me, mm. you know. And then he was just funny as well. <laughs> you know, he was like funny and cool and he could express these ideas in a way that was accessible and that was entertaining. And I could kind of, it wasn't work to listen to him. Mm. You know, it, it was kind of improving because there was there were ideas that I never had strung together or there were ways that I never thought of. And, and it got to the point where I could hear Michael talk about something. And if it didn't really like map onto the way I thought about it instinctively, there would be part of me that would kind of go, OK, well, how is he right? And I'm wrong. Hmm. And that was I kind of for a long that. time. There was a point where I would be like, well, he's clearly thought about it. He might have thought about it more than me. What am I missing? As opposed to what did he miss? Um, and just he was he was just so human. He wasn't some kind of like logical debate lord guy, even though he could, you know, he could definitely dismantle and build up an argument. He had that kind of um, that sort of that faculty. Um, the, the other clip to watch is, well, the entire appearance at Lafayette which yes. is really Michael at like the the pinnacle Absolutely. um and um and there as a microcosm again an entry joke to it um Michael Brooks answers a question about Israel mm -hmm. but the whole thing goes way beyond that um but guys hi my name is Anthony Sosa uh from Fort Worth Texas I'm 37 years old and I'm a high school history teacher and a musician and I became aware of Michael through the majority report in the summer of 2019. And he quickly became my favorite member of the Majority Report. And uh, shortly after that, I became aware of the Michael Brooks Show, started watching that very regularly, and became a patron for that in December of 2019. And even though I've only known him for a short period of time, known him, even though I became aware of him for a short period of time, uh, he really impacted my life more than any, any other internet personality. And really more than most people that I've met personally. Um, and the reason why is because he understood the importance of history. He understood the importance of understanding geopolitics and seeing things from another perspective. Perspective. He understood Marx and Hegel and theory. And most of all, he was a humanist. He valued human life, uh, flaws and all, right? And he could articulate these things and keep them in a broad historical perspective. He saw the world in a way that I think more people need to, and that's with compassion and looking towards the future. His death really forced me to realize that more of us need to speak truth to power and speak truth, period. And that without his voice around to guide us, more of us would need to raise up our voices. So since his passing, I've started a nonprofit with my wife, um, to educate and organize people on the local level about local politics. We started a podcast called the Fort Worth Freedom Review to try and 
get people more involved in, in, on that level. And I've also put Michael's message in my art uh, on the album called Volume is Power through the project Temporal Distortions. And even though Michael's actual words close out the record, the whole album has a very historical perspective to it and an anti-capitalist and an anti-imperialist focus. So it's very much still inspired inspired by Michael. And that's what I can do. That's my, my art is I feel like my part that I can do in this. And we all have our own part in, in, in helping spread his message. And I feel that we all need to be doing our own part to spread that perspective that he offers, that Michael had, about how the future could be. And so I'm, th I'm so thankful to have been inspired by Michael and to be a part of this community. Thank you to Alicia for the opportunity to speak in love and solidarity, to everyone who is a part of this community and whoever is watching this love and solidarity, and to all of you guys in Michael's words, be ruthless with institutions and kind to each other. Thank you. My name is Wame. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm from Botswana. Uh, that's a country in the southern part of Africa. And yeah, uh, I, I've i been a fan of Michael Brooks's work for a few years now. And um, I just prepared a few words that I wanted to share. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll go, I'll just jump straight into it then. Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, my name is Wame, I'm 29 and I'm from Botswana, which is a country located in the southern part of Southern Africa, just above South Africa. The population is just over 2 million. It's a similar size geographically to, to France. Uh, I live in Vienna, which is the capital city of Austria, a German speaking country in Central Europe. And I've been here for about five years. So um, I'm used to introducing myself this way because I have had the privilege of growing up, studying and working in multicultural environments all my life. And um, yeah, this has played a large part in shaping my identity as a global citizen and throughout many social interactions in my life for the past few years, especially, I've been the first person from a not very well-known African country that people meet for the first time. And um, as an African living abroad, I've been confronted with many experiences that have brought forth the realization that not many people know African countries, not many people are educated about issues regarding African history, development, economies, about Africa's diversity, about Africa's excellence and its resilience. And Africa for the most part has been stereotyped in the media, overlooked and erased. Uh, however, there are visible trends in popular culture today that are showing a shift away from those archaic portrayals of Africa. So I'm very interested in current affairs and even though I've never been to the United States, I'm well aware of how American foreign policy affects the rest of the world. And I first watched Michael on the majority report. And at this stage, this was a few years ago, um, I had been an avid consumer of online political commentary. I watched a lot of uh, American lefty shows and, uh, but I felt very removed from a lot of these shows because they centered on American politics, like internal politics. And uh, even though uh, these other, uh, a lot of the shows that I watched uh, did cover topics of foreign policy and international news, I do believe that Michael's show was quite unique in its emphasis on being global and to me, his work was very refreshing and it inspired me to educate myself about the world around me and even my own home continent through the lens of history. And I appreciated his segments on African history uh, with uh, Professor Milton Alimadi. I enjoyed those segments a lot. And um, I could definitely sense his vision of 
cosmopolitan socialism and his love and respect for other cultures. It was apparent and it was inspiring. The Michael Brooks show renewed my interest in African history because I didn't really get enough of this in school. Uh, and so Michael's work played a huge part in shaping my personal pan-Africanist journey. And um, I discovered other African outlets through his show and I'm also grateful for that. So yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say some words about Michael Brooks and his work. Um, I still miss his laugh, his funny impressions and his message of compassion and solidarity. Thank you. My name is Tom Hall and I'm up here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was raised uh, fairly poor and had a lot of uh, tumult in my life as a teenager and, um, you know, drinking drugs and juvenile detention and uh, eventually army and jail. And so I've always been a leftist and, and uh, kind of what I would call a radical anti-capitalist, but also kind of radically anti-political and just didn't didn't have any faith or hope or investment in the idea that anything could change or would change or that I could have any impact in the world. And for me, like radical was like watching Bill Maher, you know, like, um, which I, <laughs> I don't do anymore. But uh, at the time, I, I saw Cornell West on there a couple of times and uh, and followed him on Twitter. And, uh, and so it was that on July 21st of last year, um, he tweeted um, something that, that he was still in shock over the loss of, of his dear friend and comrade, Michael Brooks. Uh, so for me, that was the first I had ever heard of Michael, unfortunately. And, um, and, then, and then I started seeing that in my feed from wow. a lot of different people. And I was just like, who, who is this Michael Brooks person that everybody seems to be so you know, upset about? And so... That's how I, I uh, found TMBS and um, started noticing, uh, I became a patron right away because I thought, wow, I like what this guy is talking about. Socialism, seriously, like this was a serious thing. And it was a quote because I've, I've called myself a cynic all my life, which is by my excuse for not, you know, being engaged uh, in the world. <laughs> uh, somebody asked him, how he how he avoids being cynical or something to that effect and he said uh that he he does he considers cynicism pseudo sophistication and when he said that i just thought like at first of course i was just insulted <laughs> <laughs> and i've thought about it a lot ever since then and i've just like yeah you know that's true it, it is that quote was like okay every time i start getting cynical or thinking you know pessimistically or negatively First, I watch a Cornell West video because that's impossible to remain like cynical. And then I, uh, I, I think about Michael's quote. Yes. Yeah, and that was an important thing that I got from him also was the idea that, that uh, he, he, he was emphatic that he wanted the left to have power and to mm -hmm. take power and not just like win the culture war, but actually yeah. like be able to make change. And, and so my name's Luca. I was originally born in Ecuador and I was raised up, up until I was 17. I currently live in England in Hartford. Uh, in terms of how he influenced me, he really changed everything about me in terms of, you know, going from liberal social democrat to full on unapologetic socialists. And the one thing I really enjoyed about him was the fact that, you know, when I started getting politicized a little bit, a lot of the arena politically was very, you know, performative nonsense. And also I came a bit from that, you know, coming um, up in the punk scene where everything is just, you know, subcultural things. But with him, you know, for one, he was super funny. So it was very easy to sort of make the connection there with um, <laughs> all that laugh, all that laugh. And um, it also helped me think really about how I should view politics. But to give you one concrete example, I left Ecuador around the time that the pink tide started in Ecuador and um, initially because again my things was a bit more performative and I didn't fully understand socialist politics to mean the painter president Rafael Correa I saw as basically Satan and then as I sort of understood how I was explaining how we should view these things these days I look at things more strategically like I don't expect to paraphrase them this is not fantasy football like you know voting is not a, an expression of my essence and ever since you know I th view things a lot more differently 
The other thing that he's helped with is dealing with some, for lack of a better word, unwoke people in my life and also how, knowing how to deal with things a bit more carefully with a lot more kindness and, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, just one thing that I really liked and really struck with me because, again, if you gather by the fact that I started in one place and live in a completely different place is the internationalism. You know, just really delving into all regions of the world with all sorts of different people and, Quite frankly, just, you know, to me, he was like the new version of a rock star for me. Well, that's what he was, unfortunately. He's, I mean, he actually, so remember when he when he passed, I couldn't believe, like, I never had a chance to meet him. I think we spoke once briefly and, um, you know, he is this sorely, sorely missed, but, you know, I'm carrying on his work, like, to the point that I read my child uh, against the web and he makes up past the, uh, what's, what's the first chapter? I think it's Sam Harris's first chapter. He's a five-year-old autistic child and he actually put up with that whole first chapter. We should we should reprint the book and put that as the blurb. Yeah, no, it was quite <laughs> it was quite impressive because I mean, I just said, you know what? Let's let's give you a go. I'm sick of Peppa Pig. Let's see if you can read a, an adult book. And I just started in at one point after I finished somehow. I was like, no, I'm done. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Every time chance I get, I pass on the book to everybody. No, it's a sh it's a shame that you don't have um the book is only in English because there are some people that I know of that you know. Um, for, particularly in Latin America and some, other, and some parts of the Middle East who are friends of mine and family members that don't really speak English that well or don't fully get it. So I think, fuck, if only the, these things were, were either yeah. like Arabic or Spanish. We should, we should look into that. I, I, um, that's like one of the, the many things that there's just been so much going on I hadn't really thought about, but that's, that's a really important thing to look into. Fantastic. All right. Take care. Bye. Love and solidarity. Take care. Bye. Um, I'm Rob Vanilla. Uh, I'm from Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I stumbled across a video online of Michael uh, doing a breakdown of a Mark Blythe lecture on austerity. Didn't know who Michael was, didn't know uh, Majority Report. This was maybe five years ago. And uh, I was hooked on it because I, uh, I liked uh, the academic aspect. I liked the international aspect, but it was really just about um, people and, and, you know, sort of explaining your ideology to people. And at that time I was working at a bank and I had worked at banks my whole life and I obviously didn't like it. And I thought to myself, I, I could actually start this. I was doing some organizing and some activism in Wilmington locally. So I knew some journalists, I knew candidates, I knew people who were doing political work. And I thought, ah, if I just get two microphones, you know, maybe I could do this. Uh, and then, so we just started doing it um highlands bunker podcast on pot on uh, patreon and so that's what i'm doing uh, with my with my life now and i really try to ask myself you know i i read michael's book um and i think that that concept of cosmopolitan socialism is really important mm -hmm. because it comes at things with uh, sort of a you know an intellectual vigor uh mm -hmm. and an internationalism but also like caring for a person you know, just a one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. you know, have some care for a person. So, yeah, I was very inspired by his work. Um, you know, I, I don't have to tell you uh, anything about how I felt uh, when he when he passed away, because mm -hmm. um, you probably felt it a million times more. Uh, but, yeah, I, I was very inspired. And so, um, yeah, that's my story. Everyone, uh, my name's Uthman Ali. I'm based out of Birmingham, England. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Uthman Ali. I'm based out of Birmingham, England. And Michael was an incredibly influential figure for me. He said, I'm just going to read out the letter I wrote. So, dear Alicia, Michael was my favorite political commentator and I regularly re-watch re his work. My final year of law school heavily focused on international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. I started listening to Michael and realized the guy was like a virtual assistant who knew just about everything about everything. He was probably one of like six people on YouTube that knew how the UN actually functioned. In short, he was like my left-wing Jewish theory. His reporting of events in Brazil was incredible. Without him, I would have been completely ignorant of Lula's imprisonment and so many other issues. What made him so great was how approachable and down-to-earth he seemed. He was just a normal guy with a good heart that liked to read and could think critically. Unlike a lot of academics, he could explain things so clearly without any hint of smugness or elitism. Looking back, he was basically the opposite of Sam Harris. As a Muslim, I'll always be appreciative of how he dismantled Islamophobia and all forms of bigotry. His intuitiveness is perhaps what I'll miss the most. He was an incredible judge of character and he could see the real motivations behind actions. 
If Michael was cautious of any political candidate or commentator, his suspicion was always justified. On the other hand, he introduced me to a whole network of other brilliant people with good intentions, such as Cornel West and David Feldman. His positivity in the face of adversity was truly unique. The way he used humour and didn't take himself ser too seriously was awesome. He never failed to make me laugh, even during my worst circumstances. For example, I remember laying on the hospital floor in a makeshift bed next to a friend who had severe health complications in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep, and I was listening to the Michael's clip where he laughed at Owen Benjamin, where Owen Benjamin called out all the other guys in the IDW, and even then I just couldn't, st I just couldn't stop laughing. Humour aside, the most significant argument he made was for the importance of internationalism. We live in a hyper-connected world and, every and unity is our only option. The COVID-19 pandemic highlights how all our lives are interconnected now. Any political strategy that ignores this is doomed to fail. The fact that I am writing this letter to you, someone I have never met, about a guy I watch online, further showcases this. Thankfully, the recent social media attention concerning events in Palestine and other countries fills me with hope that the world is starting to wake up and demand something different from the status quo. I will continue to share Michael's work and his legacy will live on through the countless others he inspired. I will continue to pray for you, Michael and the rest of your family. Thank you for sharing the message of solidarity and thank you to everyone else that continues to share. Uh, so my name is Shelka and I come from Mexico, so specifically the state of Veracruz, which is like east center next to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, yeah, this question is quite like, I was thinking about how to put it in words right before to come to the call because there's just like so much to say. But um, to try to make it uh, more reduced, <laughs> uh, I would say that, yeah, I, I, Michael, I think of him like this kind of person that I never actually met in person, but I have this feeling that like I met him because he just like helped me so much to understand how the world functions, even if it sounds kind of dramatic, but I was 21 years old when I started listening to the podcast. And at this time, I was even considering myself to not really be like a political person, even if I don't really like how that sounds. But I was like, you know, like I always had this insecurity, like, oh, I don't know much about this subject I don't really know what to say I don't know all the names and the information so I was kind of insecure and I think in the right-wing media there's has always been like sometimes they use the world complex to refer to certain political situations so I always thought like it's so complicated I guess I cannot really understand and when I started listening to Michael talk about like all these subjects like it became very clear that it was not that complicated and that he actually had such a simple and like humoristic way of, you know, like explaining so many situations. So it really helped me to feel more confident in, in this subject. So even if uh, at that time, now every time there's like a conversation, I, I, I don't just stay quiet. Like, I'm like, no, I think I, I have something to say because I heard this guy who, you know, like I, so he helped me a lot to, to see things clearly. And also coming from Mexico where the media is, well, not maybe not all the media, but most of the media is uh, kind of corrupted. And um, yeah, they're kind of like right wing, uh, directed I would say uh, I never really trusted like a platform or a media for talking about what's going on in Mexico so for me it was so uh, amazing that Michael had such an interest in like in a global way and to have someone even from United States not only talking about what's going on in the United States but to have this like worldview and talk about AMLO being president now of Mexico, which I'm really happy about. Uh, yeah, it was just uh, amazing. I really, so I think that was uh, a big point for me to have this, uh, this reference actually. And he was also just, I mean, I really appreciate uh, the way he was because when he, I think the first time I heard uh, he talked about Mexico. I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I need to let him know because I'm, <laughs> I think you noticed by now that I'm kind of a reach out person. I kind of like, like to reach out and tell people, even if they don't answer, it's okay. I just want to like, let them know. 
And so I, I searched him on Instagram and I found his account and I was like, I'm going to send him a message. But even if he might not respond, because I'm sure he has all these people reaching to him. And like he responded so fast and he was so uh, kind and nice. And I think um, he was so thankful for the feedback. And eventually even like, I always thought like, I'm sure he don't remember. So I'll te I test it. I have, sorry, my English. Uh, I texted him uh, several times. Um, yeah, like to say other things about the podcast. And he was always like remembering who I was. So I don't know. It was just, uh, he really was just such a kind uh, person and so humble also, even if he was doing like all this amazing work. And I think he was just someone that you could reach out for like anything. I really, and yeah, I just really... I think there's really in my point of view uh, on so many things like this before I heard Michael Brooks and after I heard Michael Brooks, it really marks some kind of uh, face in my life. So some kind of stage. So yeah, I think, I mean, maybe I said it quite fast, but I think that's kind of. <laughs> no, you said it beautifully. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that you reached out to him. I know that he really appreciated that. And um, thanks for reaching out to me. Hello, my name is Josh Rivera, and I am from Orange County, California. And uh, I just wanted to say that Michael Brooks was um, just, he woke me up completely. Uh, I was a Sam Cedar fan, a Majority Report fan, and uh, more and more listening to the years, you, you heard Michael. And at first you're just like, who is this guy? And where, you know, he's just amazing. And the laughter and uh, as the sh time went on I honestly watched the Sam Cedar show for Michael Brooks and he was just so incredible and their chemistry was amazing and um, it was his bravery more than anything um, the way he would talk about issues that are very touchy um, I, I remember him talking about on Palestine and talking about how the situation is not complicated, which is like the most crazy thing you could think someone would say. But Michael is saying it from a, a true place and a place of justice. And, you know, it was just so inspiring to see him. And uh, I just want to read something, what I wrote on the day Michael passed, because it still feels the same way. Absolutely devastated. Rest in power, Michael Jamal Brooks. This is too shocking for me to quite believe still. Michael Brooks was the best of the lefties. So kind-hearted and righteous and maybe most of all hysterical and with a great knack uh, for all things humorous. The left's movement is filling a massive void today and one that will take a while to ever fill again. Talked to a friend and we agreed Michael would have been in the footsteps of one of his heroes, Brother Cornell West. He was just too young to die, and they say that and they say the good die young, and I believe it. I'll miss you forever. You were like a mentor to me, even though we didn't know each other. Your words and your being made me feel like I knew you my whole life. Rest in power, Michael Brooks. Rest in power, Michael Brooks. We love you and miss you. My name is Mark. I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. And I discovered uh, Michael's work when I was uh, studying political science uh, at Dalhousie. So I was in probably my third or fourth year at the time. And I was watching all things political on YouTube because I mean, I study politics, so I might as well watch it. And uh, I ran into the majority report and covered Sam and the crew. And, and I really noticed Michael at first because not only was he hosting on Thursday, so I was like, okay, this is somebody else that's coming in and, and taking over. But uh, my first thought after hearing him speak was he could be a guest lecturer in, in one of my classes. There was so much information. There was so much dedication and passion behind his words. And everything he said was coherent enough, but uh, abstract enough that you could really like apply both to what was happening around you, but also just like starting to think, you know, bigger and more and more uh, global. And so uh, I then started, I was, I was just immediately enamored, 
like I was just absolutely taken aback. And so um, I started following him on, on, on Twitter and, and, and following uh, his YouTube show. I became a Patreon of, of his show at the beginning. And uh, I was just absolutely inspired just by how much he spoke with such conviction and such clarity and such uh, poise on what needs to be done and what work needs to be done. And, 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 you know, like I, I, I'm autistic, so I, I don't really connect emotionally and spiritually a lot, but the way he spoke in a way that felt logical, that felt, you know, like it, it came from more than just, just, abstract it actually just it felt grounded and 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 it allowed me to see things from a perspective that I didn't think I was gonna see things from because you know when you're autistic you have such a uh, a one-track mind sometimes and so Michael was really good at allowing me to uh view things through a different analysis and different perspective and it really got me much more inspired about internationalism and 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 you know realizing how much more we have in common with each other than what we don't and, right. and how much we could accomplish if we realize that and, and, and just kind of all focus on that. So, um, yeah, I was, yeah, he, he really did a, a, a good number on me on inspiring <laughs> and, 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 and pushing me towards where I am now politically and, and who I am as a person having me, it was a honor and a privilege. And I guess, if we could all just take his words of be kind to people and be ruthless to the institutions that get in our way, I think we could all just be in a, a better world and a better place. I was actually quite shocked when I discovered of his passing uh, about how, um, how much I felt it because normally when famous people or celebrities pass away, I was always very interested in sort of the parallel social relationship people have with them. Um, <laughs> And it sort of reflected on me and I realized that he had a really big impact on sort of my ideological development. Um, but then also during the pandemic, I was like really depressed and stuff. And yeah. literally one of the only two things that I would look forward to in the day, other than like a spliff, would be knowing that he would be on the show and, you know, just his energy and his laughter and everything else knowing that he's not around is um, really hard and stuff. And I know he really didn't talk about like, his mental health and stuff like that, but I always got the feeling that he was the kind of guy that had his own demons. And without him explicitly talking about it, knowing that he, um, he was doing all the things he was doing and having that or whatever things he was going through as a man sort of made me feel like, oh, okay, like, I can, you know, I can do this too and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like, it's really weird. It's really nice talking to you. It's really nice um, sort of connecting with you. I hope that, um, I wish you all the best. I hope that, you know, that there's nothing that can replace, there's nothing I can say that's going to sort of replace his loss and replace the place he had in your life and all our lives and everything else. You know, but like, I, I sort of was inspired to join um, a union, um, the London Renters Union, um, and sort of as off the back of that as well, I've also started a union. Uh, but I'll just say that, like, I'll just say that, like, um, I'm from London, and también como un colombiano que habla español, eh, la perspectiva internacional de Michael ha sido una cosa muy genial y muy importante para mi conocimiento de los diferentes movimientos políticos en África, en Asia, especialmente en Latinoamérica. Um, y sí, básicamente, uh -huh. si hay una persona que también habla español viendo esto, then they understand what I just said. No, I but, know. I, yeah. I, I'm embarrassed. I don't speak more Spanish, but thank you. And <laughs> no I, I basically live in Mexico. I live, I live in Southern California. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mark against me that I'm not fluent at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you'll get there. You'll get, you'll I get hope so. I hope so. Be well, yeah, my no, friend. Totally. Love and solidarity. Take care. Take care. Really hard because I spent a lot of time thinking about it. But my name's uh, Josh Elstro. Uh, I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so I, I guess I'll try to like maybe just to get a different perspective than maybe what other people are saying. Is I sent you when you sent out this like solicitation, this thing that I wrote um, 
the night he died, I just like started kind of journaling. Um, and it turned into, uh, this short essay, uh, that I shared online, just on like a few accounts that I have like social media accounts and, uh, people really seem to like it. Um, but I, I really focused on like, um, sort of like what Michael meant to me as like, uh, a like role model for like masculinity. Um, which is something I find as somebody like in his peer group age range, like really difficult to find uh, that. I think what, what I got from him was like a masculinity that's rooted in um, humanism, like in seeing people's humanity um, and understanding like the hierarchies at play um, in all the sort of different uh, like power structures that like corrupt masculinity and turn it into toxic masculinity. And he always seemed to like fall on the right side of that uh, fight. And it's, it's something I've really struggled with because his voice was one of the few that I felt like you could look to as somebody who, um, yeah, like kind of embodied that. Um, and uh I, if I can add this, like almost within a couple of weeks, a year earlier, uh, one of my best friends passed away. Um, and he was my sort of like, sorry, you know, in person um, contact to a, again, that kind of masculinity where um, I think it's hard for men to be vulnerable, to be tender with each other. Um, to be emotionally open. Um, and I, um, in my piece that I wrote, I wrote a lot about how, uh, I, I, you know, capitalism is, is at the root of, of a lot of that. It yeah. uh, sort of weighs down on us and uh, tells us to like fall in line and behave, you know, this, that, or the other way. Um, and the stuff, especially like in his last year, we had him that Michael was getting into about, um, you know, like a, a like cosmopolitan socialism for everyone uh, is just like the only voice I found that <laughs> cast that truly aside and broke through the like cancel culture nonsense of like, <laughs> it needs to be for everyone or it's just going to be another like tool of capitalism. Like I think every single day about uh what he said about um sorry no, no, no. <laughs> um it, you know it, people have kind of paraphrased as like be ruthless with institutions and be really kind with people and I'm sure a lot of people are bringing that up um <laughs> yeah yeah I'm just really grateful for that it, it was like really cathartic to have like expressed those thoughts and uh mm -hmm have people read it and like really understand it. And I, I really, um, I think I said this in my initial email, like, you know, I, I credit for Michael, I credit Michael for like instilling that, um, uh, I don't know, that sort of like sense of empathy in people and that it's going to like that. I, that was just kind of an example of like, it's already like the, the roots are spreading. I'm yeah. finding when I can get in that space where you get one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with somebody, um, people are ready to talk about this stuff mm -hmm. and they're ready to just like log off, you know, <laughs> like yeah. get away from that stuff. It's poison. Like, yeah. uh, and like have a real conversation and like realize that like real change is, it's going to be in front of you with a surrounded by people you care about in your community um, it's not in that space of Twitter. And I think like, if Michael was still here, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I feel like that would continue to spread that message. But I, I think it's going to continue to spread from the seeds he's laid. I hope so. <clears throat> it feels that way. Is there a way to, um, shout out where people can maybe read your article? Um, is it accessible? Maybe put like a link to like a sub stack on my Twitter or something. It's just at Josh Elstro, E-L-S-T-R-O. Okay. So. Well, appreciate, appreciate you, uh, your thoughts on all this. I think the more men that can kind of come out as being, uh, you know, looking 
not just saying men are toxic and evil and bad and we should all just go away because I don't think that's really going to uh, solve anything <laughs> and kind of actually yeah. grappling with with the nuances of, of masculinity and um, being human is it's it's really important. I think people are, are you know, for various reasons, don't want to delve yeah. there. So kudos to <laughs> I, you. I think uh, a lot of us are feeling really lonely and Michael's voice yeah. made us feel a little less lonely. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing it with us yeah. while he was alive and keeping it going now. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Love yeah. and solidarity. Stay well, Josh. Same to you. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Hard in the second. I'm from Shawnee, Oklahoma. Host the Green Corn Rebellion show on YouTube with Michael. Um, let's see. Started watching the majority report in 2017, like in August. And it was like right before he started the Michael Brooks show. And I started, I, I think I've watched the first episode, but then like, I didn't keep up with it. And then I became friends with him on Facebook and he told me to keep watching it. And so I did, I caught up with other episodes and I kept watching and I liked his show cause it was around the time I first started becoming a socialist, started learning a little bit more about politics, even though I'd already knew quite a bit uh, cause I'd followed it most of my life. But from him, I I used to be just consider myself to be anti-war, even anti-interventionist. But then he um, opened my eyes to um, a lot of other things that were going on around the world and not to be so much just anti-war, but more anti-imperialist. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of solidarity, not just with people here in America, but with people across the planet him and a handful of other left-wing content creators uh influenced me when it came to starting my own show and i eventually ended up interviewing him my name is Esiel gutierrez and i'm calling from uh, houston texas uh the way that michael brooks inspired me and changed my life he first introduced uh his viewers to a couple of authors, um, progressive authors that really changed um, the United States. Uh, the way he also gave me an understanding of how politics works uh, and how the systems uh, that already existing in in this country actually do not work for workers or for the poor they uh, usually work for the wealthy and it also gave me a sort of insight on how uh, the progressive movement um began and his work uh inspired me to become humanitarian meaning that um because he cared about people Mm -hmm. and about the poor and about the working class uh and he dedicated his life to um, ed educating people um through his shows um it, it it gave me an inspiration to also do that um and currently i am working on um trying to join an organization that helps uh, people and also uh, my dream is to one day be able to publish a book yeah. about um, how uh, Michael Brooks inspired me and also uh, about how we as progressives can change the world. It also gave me an inspiration to one day probably um, run for a for U.S. representative um and yeah basically he inspired me to become more passionate about politics my name is Susie, and i'm from el paso texas and i just wanted to share in the collective loss over michael brooks's death and also the celebration of his life and what he was to the to the left um the story that i wanted to tell is about um kind of how he converted me from a sort of ineffective, woke uh, leftism to uh, 
to something different. We heard a lot of stories when he died of from uh, people on the right who he kind of changed and and we didn't hear uh, how he uh, did that for people on the left and so uh, my story is about uh, an impression that he did of Anna Navarro on Majority Report when I became ac acquainted with that show and Michael three years ago and uh, the, in the impression, you know, Anna Navarro is saying that John McCain was a classy war criminal, that he was a war criminal who did it with a certain degree of class, and, uh, you know, comparing him to Donald Trump. And uh, at first, I, I mean, of course it was so funny, like everything he said, but there was this little voice inside my head saying, like, oh, that's wrong, he, you know, this white guy can't do this Latina accent. Um, and then as I became more familiar with Michael's analysis, his humor, his deep commitment to solidarity with all people, um, it totally transformed that thinking and gave me a much better understanding of how the left can be more effective um, and less alienating to people who aren't there in the, in the same kind of space as us in that way. So I just wanted to uh, express my gratitude for that and for him in that way. And to um, also say something about the importance of his conversations on spirituality, uh, in particular with Joshua Con Russell and Cornel West, um, and just how necessary that is for um, building a left, building a movement that is really rooted for, in a place of fortitude and a place of love um, for all people and for a, for a better world. So I think those are conversations that need to keep happening. And it's hard because spirituality is so personal and, uh, and hard to define and hard to talk about. But I think that that's something that needs to keep happening and I'm grateful that Michael had that courage and that bravery to do so. Um, and then just to thank everybody continuing that work that, that they started with him and maintaining that legacy. You know, Leisha, of course, David and Matt, uh, Anna and Nando, everybody at Majority Report, and just all the people who are continuing that fight uh, that Michael was fighting every day. Um, so peace, solidarity, love, thank you. It's an honor to be uh, in solidarity with each of you. Sure, yeah. I'm. My name is James Kalarist. I live here in Alexandria, Virginia. So the angle of my camera is a little weird, but I kind of wanted to put it in this room because when I talked to you, I wanted to talk to you in the room where I met your brother, which is uh, where I cooked dinner. I started listening from the first episode, you know? Mm -hmm. So Matt and David and Michael would be doing their thing. And I'm kind of doing this thing, you know? Yeah. Moving around, putting a <laughs> pot down, picking up a pot, putting a dish over here. So I, uh, you know, I was raised by evangelical Christians, um, the, like the hardcore stuff. My parents are still evangelical. Um, <laughs> the first 20 years of my life in that came out of it uh, in my 20s. Had to deprogram hard, had to read a lot. I've always been a reader. And you live in such a way that like you have a, here's a metaphysical truth. It's in your face. It's the only metaphysical truth. You got one choice. You either believe it or you're going to hell. It kind of pushes, you either do one of two things. You either say, okay, fine, you win. I'm, I'm down with that for the rest of my life where you go, okay, well, what's going on out there? Like what, I don't know that I want to sign on. And so I, I my twenties, I kind of came to left politics, but then I moved to Alexandria as I got a little older in my thirties and I started being around, you know, what lefties like to talk about is the professional managerial class of the DC area. And I just, the group think of this area kind of hit me. And I really kind of lost my left roots. And I also didn't really have a firm grounding and left ideology from the basics. So Michael came along in my life at a time when like, I, I kind of had this left wing political thoughts kind of humming in the background, but it wasn't streamlined into something cohesive. And, and I think your brother really got me when he rolled his eyes about Elizabeth Warren. And I went, wait, isn't she one of the good ones? And he rolled his eyes and made jokes about Sam Harris, people like that. Which I, I guess I didn't really, Michael was like, this guy's awful. And I thought, well, he seems all right. And the only reason I thought these people were okay was because I was just lazy in my, my thinking. And I hadn't really, I needed someone to challenge me to really kind of dig deep. 
And also Michael's uh, attention to history was really important to me. I, I have a degree in history. So like thinking about historical things comes second nature to me. And he was landing all of his politics in the long-term historical materialism that comes out of a real left uh, left frame that made a lot of sense to me. And he just changed my thinking. I mean, he just, I've been reading thousands and thousands of pages and I really do attribute it to your brother's influence. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know. I just, he changed the way I think so much. Well, for me was like, don't be so lazy, James. You can do this, but it was always the way he talked about politics was always so kind and so much so that I felt like I had a friend in my kitchen next to me. Um, you know, like just dig a little deeper and try a little harder and also be kind, be kind to people and don't be lecturing. Don't come off as a hoity toity. I know more than you because mm -hmm. you're not going to get, we're not going to get anywhere. Hello everyone. This is Carl in Korea. I miss Michael a lot. I miss his jokes. I miss his wisdom. I miss his compassion. He made international politics cool. Sending my love to everyone else out there that misses him too. Be strong. Bye. I'd been kind of, uh, you know, back in the past, about four or five years ago, I'd been really struggling to find like a show or a community that really felt uh, welcoming as far as political spaces go. Uh, and, uh, and further, I was also very fascinated by Jordan Peterson, not in like a, I like him kind of way, but I just thought he was very scummy. And I feel like the person who really got it and really understood what he was doing, uh, as kind of like a con artist was Michael Brooks. And that, you know, watching him just led me to watching one thing to the next, to the next. And the more I watched and the more I was thinking this guy's fucking brilliant he's not just a political commentator but an actual thinker an intellectual um even though maybe he wouldn't say that he is but um i just think it, it, once i found him i felt like uh there was a whole new world open to me and even though I was looking for a group to feel accepted by, I feel like discovering him made me accept others more. Uh, again, his his motto of loving people and hating the system, um, I feel like his approach to politics, his knowledge of politics, it all intertwines uh, and in this beautiful way that's very humanistic, but also smart and doesn't get caught up in um, bullshit and drama. And I feel like uh, the kind of uh, squabbles and uh, the squabbles that uh, we get into, especially on Twitter, uh, and just everything going on that doesn't mean anything, um, he was very good at parsing through and pushing through and uniting people. Um, so, yeah, rest in peace to uh, one of the best to ever do it, uh, and somebody who, um, if he had more years on this earth like he deserved, uh, he would have uh, changed the world. And I think he already has. Um, so rest in peace, Michael. Um, yeah, so my name is Nick Olbrick, or Nicholas Olbrick. Um, I'm calling in from Australia uh melbourne australia we've just gone into another lockdown uh and i don't know quite where to start but there was there, there was just so much that michael gave us um and the things i think everyone is going to comment on his his laughter and i think that was you know, very, very much indicative of his personality and who he was. But what I noticed in that is he had this great ability to be calm and to always reset incredibly quickly. And that's what allowed that laughter. And I was, you know, in awe of his ability to go from 
you know, almost a white rage over a particular topic, whether it was a sort of um, misrepresentation of Lula or, um, you know, some some act of inhumanity by Trump or whatever. And, and he would cut straight to the heart of it and, and get straight to the point. And then next minute, they'd play a Dave Rubin clip and he'd be laughing his head off. And I'd be listening and it would be like this moment of like whiplash because I'm still angry. And yet he's already reset and, and, and gone on. It's interesting. Um, just before you came on, I, I was going through some clips and there's a, there's a, a video that was released in 2018 that is worthwhile watching. It's a little bit morbid, but it's called Alex Jones is having, uh, Alex Jones not having a great year apparently. And Alex is, is going on about death and we're all going to die and it's all humanity's over and all this. And Michael just interrupts and he says, pause it. I'm sorry, we are all going to die. And therefore we should use that mortality as a motivation to make the most of our time on earth and to treat each other well and to live to the fullest. That's absolutely true. Alex Jones is speaking the truth. And he goes on to talk about how we're literally breathing the same air as Buddha and that we should practice reflecting every morning about we will be dead fairly soon and ask ourselves how we want to be while we're here. It's actually a great practice. And there are different things that, that can be said and will be said in this tribute um, that, that are like that, direct quotes from Michael because he was so tuned in to his, his presence in the world and, and that reflected everything. But for me, I think the most, and I'm, tr I'm trying not to cry. I mean, it's, it's really difficult, um, but the most, important thing was his thirst for knowledge mm. and how deeply invested he was in just really knowing at, at the most rigorous level like you know the Michael Brooks show was essentially a, a PhD level course every week and and then there's the whole other side of it and I think I sent you some videos over Instagram of just how he could use that knowledge to completely subvert the discourse. And, and it was so much fun with, with Michael. And so those two things are just, you know, I don't know. I, I, from, from an eight-year-old boy ringing in to talk about, to talk trash on Bill Clinton, but still see clear-eyed that Clinton was going to sweep the South or whatever it was, to... Um, you know, a, a man absolutely on the charge and he changed the game. He read the meta game better than any other contributor to American politics. And he did it because he could see the political economy and he saw the way that the globalized dynamics worked. And so you can't just fix a problem here without also addressing it there. And he brought that together and, and he wasn't, his, his mission perhaps wasn't to unify the left, but he became a unifying figure for the left that allowed disparate groups who would otherwise be at each other's throats to see a, a path together. And that legacy is, is something that, that I will be eternally grateful for. Um, but it's, it's difficult every day. I miss him every day, and I'm sure you do as well. My name is Ian. I'm from California. And um, you know, to be honest, I got on the, uh, I got on the Michael train fairly late in the game, so to speak. Yeah, it wasn't really until like the very beginning of the pandemic when I got sick with COVID and I was just like lying in bed. Um, when I really start to like, you know, dive into the uh, the majority report, Sam Cedar, Michael Brooks, that whole you know that whole universe, it was the first time that I had found somebody who shared many convictions that for me had just been like floating around as a bunch of you know these like amorphous maybes. You know, this idea that we can we can build a left that 
builds the working class into a you know to this this um, you know this transracial community that's cosmopolitan that um, that is accepting of spirituality that's built on kindness and you know the fact that that was Michael's cutting edge of politics kindness you know something that you know it seems so simple almost childish in a way but it's really more childlike you know it cut me real deep that you know as soon as I found like this this real positive example you know a couple months later boom gone taken away when Michael passed you know he was 36 I was already 32 at the time and it just had me thinking like what am I doing with my life you know what the, what the hell am I doing you know, a year ago, you know, I was, I was just really adrift. I was just like, you know, where do I fit into all this? You know, where am I going, you know? With, with Michael's passing, you know, I just kind of like held on to that as like, you know, make this matter. You know, make this be something that pushes you to do something you hadn't been doing before. Find focus in this. And, you know, since then I've gotten myself on track to... You know, do field work where I'm you know, meeting with and interviewing and learning from labor insider outsider coalitions in Latin America. You know, without Michael's work and without his example and without that sense of urgency, you know, I, I don't know if I would have found you know, that focus and that direction. So I just want to say Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everyone in the Brooks family and in the Michael Brooks Show family and the Majority Report family. What you do matters so much more to so many more people than you'll ever know. Hi, I'm Sandy from Ontario, Canada. A while ago, I wanted to help change the world and felt the best way for me to do that would be from inside the political system. To prepare for that, I was studying debate styles and found Sam Cedar, which led me to the Majority Report and Michael. Like many people, I was blown away by Michael's ability to see the bigger picture, and I admired his compassion and attention to issues not covered by most. He was one of the few people who could add sharp, intelligent humor to politics, and that really resonated with me. My experience with politics broke me in a way I didn't know was possible. I stopped living and I wanted it to be over. I continued to watch MR and TMBS. It gave me some comfort knowing there were still people, especially like Michael, speaking up and fighting for change. One day I was watching Michael's show and he said something that caused me to pause and ask the question, why am I still here? Why am I holding on? It's because despite how much I hated my life. I really like who I am. And what makes me me is my integrity, my principles, my compassion, my humor, my drive to want to make the world a better place for everyone. The part of me that helped me persevere through my difficult life. So who would I be if I let that part go and gave up now? Okay, so... This part of myself won't let me quit. Now what? How do I get my voice out there? Politics was a fail. Well, why not the same way as Michael? That was the moment my show, Left of the Box, came to be. Even though I had no idea what I was doing or getting myself into, this gave me something to move forward with. Since then, I've connected with amazing people like Matt, who helped me rediscover my talent for art. I have grown and learned so much about myself because of my show, and it wouldn't have happened without Michael. Staying true to him, I am using my snippy, quippy humor to call out the powerful and criticize the system while having compassion for people. I never had the chance to thank Michael for what he did for me, but I felt this would be a fitting tribute. Using the gift I thought I had lost. Leisha, I drew this for you if you wish to accept it. And this one is for Sam and the MR crew. These drawings are so much more than what you see here, and it would mean the world to me to share this gift with you. Thank you.
and rest in power, Michael Brooks. Uh, my name is Armar Tarosian. I'm zooming in from Los Angeles. Um, I'm, in, yeah, I'm, so I'm currently working at the Armenian National Committee of America's Impact Media Institute initiative. Sorry, that was a mouthful. But essentially, we're working to combat genocide, denial, and potential perpetration occurring around the world and monitoring the media reporting around it. And so that project actually like really connects to a lot of what attracted me about Michael's work, where he had a paired meticulous insight with a groundedness in um, social movements and the suffering of human beings abroad and domestically. Um, and he really tried to have like a positive motivating vision um, that was also rooted in his empathy as well which I found incredibly compelling when I would watch his stuff. Um, so even just those aspects made his show my favorite by far, um, just because of how powerful and compelling his uh, work could be, um, knowing that he could balance it with a great sense of humor and wit, which I think was very rare to see for this kind of space, international relations, leftist politics, like, usually these things come off very dry and dull and off-putting. Um, and so being, seeing someone who's genuinely curious about bringing more people into a uh, global perspective, I think is crucial. And it's part of why I always like try to seek out, even if I'm doing work that's for a particular community, seeing where there are like the coalition partners or the people who've had similar experiences and connecting them to a broader movement. Uh, and lastly, I'll say like, you know, a way that he really like uh, inspired me in terms of my activism was just parsing out a lot of the confusion that I would feel, a lot of the hopelessness I would feel, um, or having these questions that I was frustrated by and never knowing how to give a clear answer. Um, and so when I would watch Michael's show, he would always be the one to give guidance or refreshing perspective. Um, and yeah, the last thing I'll just say is uh, he, his work and like, I mean, obviously his passing left my jaw open and I really just could not believe that that could happen to such an incredible figure who was already building momentum for this project. Um, but yeah, I really want to start a podcast in a similar vein of like dissecting complex foreign policy issues and then seeing how social movements on the ground can impact them uh, in any like minor way, even though I'll never really have the capacity to, to match him. Hopefully there are ways where I can like continue the vision of his work in my own personal work. <laughs> my name is Christopher Lilagen Hansen. I am from Norway and I work for the Norwegian Council for Africa and I'm doing an MA in Development Studies as well. I am also a huge fan of Michael Brooks and I wanted to share my thoughts on Michael. Uh, I want to reiterate what so many have said and written about Michael. His warm personality, his compassion, his humor, his contagious laugh made me feel like I really lost a close friend last year even though I've never talked to Michael before. Um, I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, and it just comes down to Michael just being such a likable and down-to-earth person. I felt like I could really relate to him. Michael had an international perspective and solidarity with the global working class. That is extremely rare. Uh, and I quickly became a huge fan when I discovered TMBS. Uh, he also provided deep analysis uh, and in insightful uh, perspectives on global current events that I think you, you don't find anywhere else. Um, having lived and witnessed the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, I must say that Michael's analysis of that situation is also, was also always spot on. Um, TMBS is where I learned about great people like Richard Wolff and Milton Alemadi, 
both of whom I've had the pleasure of talking to in the recent weeks about my master thesis on neoliberal reforms in Uganda, which is something I, I think Michael also would have a lot to say on that topic if I wish I could talk to him about it. Um, his knowledge and deep understanding about global current events and his ability to connect the dots is a ability of Michael's that I have not seen in a lot of other people. Maybe perhaps just someone like uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, if someone called in and asked Michael about what was happening in any country, any conflict situation, Michael was able to have a meaningful conversation about it and then connect it up to in its broader context. Uh, which I think is a really rare ability. Um, Michael also taught me how to be a better person, be ruthless with systems, be kind with people. It's probably my favorite quote. Uh, everyone could just see how kind Michael was and that he just genuinely wanted to create a better world. Michael Exposing Dave Rubin's grift and making fun of Dave Rubin's ignorance is also something that was all I always thought was both hilarious and deeply satisfying. And for me, it also symbolizes something deeper because I think in many ways, Michael was the anti-Dave Rubin. Uh, and by that, I mean that Michael Brooks was everything that Dave Rubin is not. Uh, knowledgeable, well-read, funny, curious, willing to learn. You could see that when you interview people, when you talk to people like Cornel West or Dr. Chomsky, just uh, attentive, focused, listening and soaking up every bit of knowledge from these people. Uh, TMBS also had some great episodes about great African revolutionaries like Thomas Sankara, Amilcar Cabral, uh, Patrice Lumumba, uh, people I also written about for the Norwegian Council for Africa. Uh, of course, Michael's work on Brazil uh, is also something he will be remembered for. I just saw recently saw a poll from Brazil where Lula is up 70% against Bolsonaro's 30%. So I just wish that Michael could be around next year when Lula kicks Bolsonaro's ass and wins back the presidency. And um, when he does, we will all be thinking about Michael. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Lance from The Surfs, and uh, I just wanted to say a couple things quickly about Michael. Michael Brooks was one of the first people who helped our channel come back from the dead after it got mass flagged by a bunch of, uh, let's just say, good old-fashioned Nazis, as Michael put it. Um, our channel got taken down on April Fool's last year. Uh, actually, no, two years ago. Wow, time is a flat circle now. And uh, Michael and uh, the, you know, the majority report uh, amplified our story and it got us taken back. And that started a friendship with Michael Brooks that I started having the absolute pleasure of having offline. Um, he was always very kind to me and he was always trying to help me out. Uh, we spoke frequently, especially about, um, you know, a, a, just a world of geopolitics. But one of the last things I ever talked to Michael about was that I was going to help him uh, build this new Michael Brooks channel uh, on the Twitch platform. And we were just starting to lay the groundwork of that, unfortunately, right before he passed. Um, I had the honor of having to speak to him uh, and I cherish every single one of those moments. He was one of the most wonderful, heartfelt, incredible human beings uh, and generous, just absolutely generous with his time, even though he was infinitely more famous than I was. Uh, it was one of the saddest moments of, uh, you know, the, the last decade, if, if not my life, to find out that he had just passed suddenly. But um, absolutely loved him uh, and uh, love all of you. And thank you so much for honoring uh, his memory with this event. My name is uh, James Justice. I'm zooming in from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I actually didn't know about Michael, unfortunately, until his passing. And it was just such a synthesis because I felt like there was this incredible void. And um, I came from actually a pretty like sort of what Michael would have described as like a 
center family, you know, a really mixed mess of a family. You know, some some people voted for Obama and then they voted for Trump and there's all these different views. So it's not sort of the stereotypical, oh, they're just, a, they fit in a box. They, they're going to go with everything the Democratic Party says or oh, they're going to go with every Republican. And unfortunately with online media, I felt like it was just this nonstop, like, well, if you think this way, then you must think about everything that way. And so I was watching the political stuff online and it was entertaining for a while. And I was agreeing with a lot of the left-leaning stuff, but there would be these videos that would frustrate me because I would be like, these people don't understand. Like they don't understand that it's possible to think this and also think this. And you could have people in your life that you love that think this, that might agree with Bernie Sanders, but then they might also be brought into this thing with Donald Trump. And there's got to be somebody online who's able to articulate a message that can talk to those people that doesn't just push them aside and throw them out of coalition, but actually maybe explains the propaganda in a way that can reach people. And I was becoming real disenchanted by a lot of people on the left. And um, I, I found Michael, thankfully. And, you know, his message was so resonant and, and so amazing. And um, so I just, I kept listening and listening and watching and listening. And, um, and I've tried to adopt his philosophy as best as I can. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because he was a, a person that you could tell his opinion was something that was from a background of knowledge that he cared so much about what he was talking about. He wasn't just saying something to say it. He wasn't just saying it to, he wasn't afraid to critically think about his side or his views. And I really feel like his maturity, his breadth of knowledge, the depth of his knowledge was so profound that being somebody that, like I said, is around all these different people who they may think one way with something, they may think the other way with something. It was so valuable because I, 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 I agree with a lot of people on the line, but I, I, I have this constant thing where like the real world is so much different than what you see online. And Michael is just so good at being able to speak in a way that I felt so much more confident to talk to friends from my hometown, to talk to family, to maybe even if possible in just sort of a casual interaction with somebody, be able to speak to them in a way that I'm not preaching because I hate no more than you because I watched a video a week ago and oh, now I'm an expert. I'm Brent Cooper. I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I do political sociology, meta theory, leftist advocacy, I think for a lot of us, Michael has continued to be on our minds every day since last July. There is a big void left in the space of the movement building and synthesis that he was pioneering. His voice and content are still a great source of guidance and inspiration in our current moment. Michael's work impacted me profoundly in two big ways. The first was just it being such a uniquely high quality standard of commentary and analysis. His depth and range was constantly proven in debates, interviews, his research and writing process, his spirituality, his comedy chops, his political ambitions. Scarcely can you find so much talent and hard work in one person. I was a nomadic leftist news junkie for years, taking it all in, but it wasn't until I found Michael and the Bernie campaign emerging in 2015 that I found a narrative and a cause that I could trust and completely throw myself into. Michael crystallized a political worldview and praxis that I'd been aspiring to. A broad-based cosmopolitan socialist synthesis, very serious about a kind of necessary global transformation, and with a lucid and joyful vision to get there. Michael was a rising star with immense potential, and to me it's no exaggeration to say his loss is as great and premature as that of Bruce Lee or Bill Hicks or Heath Ledger. What they were to their respective fields, I believe Michael was to left politics. His passing is a shocking reality check that life is precious, and a politics of love and care is absolutely imperative. Anything else is largely a waste of time. In a media landscape dominated by pseudo-intellectual dark web type people, it was inevitable that Michael would have surpassed them all and the tables would tilt back in the left's favor. 
the second way he impacted me is he was very supportive of me over a couple years and actually endorsed me on his last live stream and a couple times prior. This also was happening when I wasn't getting much solidarity from anywhere else. I'm both honored and haunted by this as I feel I fail to meet my own standards and expectations in carrying our common project forward. We certainly all fail to push Bernie through and we have to reckon with that loss every day. But the amazing Sister Leisha and others in the TMBS family have helped me to feel valued and keep the faith. 2020 was a shit show, and this year is not going so well either. But when you think about it, if we listen to our heart, we have no choice but to push on, uh, to follow Michael's lead and to fulfill his dream somehow, because they are ours too. We owe it to Michael and to each other. My name is Antonio. I'm from Frost Street, Florida, where... Uh... <laughs> it's literally out in the middle of nowhere, so I'm probably one of the only people around here that even knows who he probably is. Um, well, he's he had a very big he's had a very big impact on me because um, he was just one of those people that you know when you listen to him, there's just something about him, and when he talks, you, he's just someone who you just have to listen to. And I remember the first time I heard him was in the Majority Report. And, like, the way he was just talking about the politics of whatever the topics were, it was just so coherent, and it was easy to follow and understand, because at the time, I was just getting into it. So, listening from him, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And within the last year that he was, well, last year, um, I was even starting to catch some of his um, Sunday videos where he would do, like, book um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, like, almost trying to hold back some tears here <laughs> no no it's okay everyone's been pretty emotional it's mm -hmm. it's uh i mean it feels like nice to have tears i think yeah and um in his videos he would recommend books and i actually went out of my way to actually buy some of them so i bought this one from lula it thanks to him i know about lula i i had never even heard of him before Me and too. i haven't gotten into the book yet but I've been dying with anticipation to get into it. I and have I, Michael's copy of that book. You do? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And I even bought another one. Uh, it was a Martin Luther King book that I didn't even know existed until until one of his uh, videos. And um, God, I, thought I had what I was going to say, but then I came on here and now it's all gone. It's just, I miss him. Yeah, me too. I, I really do. I, I used to... I didn't. I wasn't able to catch all his live um, programming, but I would catch. I would watch his clips, and it's just weird going on the YouTube now. And I, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to find, um, you know, oh, what, what's he posted today, and there's not, there's never nothing there. So I just have to go back and watch the old videos, and uh, it's, it's a, it, 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 it just hits me in the heart. I, I mean, I never met him. I wish I would have, but it's just, I can't believe that for someone I never met in my life or even knew personally that they could have such an effect like that on me. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to believe there's an afterlife and that he, that he, um, that he, that he's able to see that, you know, he touched all the, all these lives he's touched. He's especially touched mine. I mean, I've, he's, he's just one of those people that I was into politics somewhat because well, my parents are immigrants, so and I had to pretty much always be paying attention to the laws and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then when I, as I got older, and I've found guys like Michael, they have, they, they have been expanding my knowledge into like all other things in politics. And I don't know where I'd be today in my, um, in, in my journey of, of, of life without guys like him. I'm going to miss um, hearing him laugh. Like right now, recently in the last couple of weeks when Sam debated Steven Crowder, yeah. I have, <laughs> I, I, every single time I see clips of that over and over again, or at, or the weeks ago when I did, I saw the clips over and over just getting shared on Twitter. I just kept thinking to myself, how, how, would, he have re how would he have reacted to something like this? How has he have responded? I texted Sam, I said, I know this is like not, this is poor language, but the only thing I can I explain this is Mike would literally be dying 
over the <laughs> oh no sam cedar what a yeah. nightmare <laughs> you can i in my brain can kind of like do the mashup of that and michael laughing yeah i, I, I can, see, can see it perfectly I, I i can see him just leaning back in his chair and just <laughs> <laughs> laughing until there's no tomorrow yeah well, I appreciate you making the time and um, hearing your story. And uh, yeah, a lot of people have discovered Michael's work post his passing. So, you know, I think continuing to share it and tell your friends about it. Um, I think a lot of people are still growing and learning politically from him. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just happy I found him before yeah. before he passed, and I, he had to have, at least have an impact before he passed on me. Me too. And, um, I know it's been a year, so I just want to give you my condolences Thank to you, you and your family about your loss. Thank you. I, I know what that feels like for me, but I can't imagine what it's like losing. He was your older brother, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, that, 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 I don't know what that would be like because in my family, I'm the oldest one. So yeah. I can't even imagine what that would be on everybody else. Well, thank you for this opportunity, Alicia. Yeah, love and solidarity. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, my name's Ethan. I'm from Calgary, Alberta, and this is how Michael Brooks impacted me. I didn't become familiar with Michael's work until hearing of his passing last year. I remember exploring his videos, both in awe of how much they resonated with me, while also grieving the fact that the world had lost such a needed voice and spirit. I was moved by Michael's deep empathy for others, his ability to see our common humanity, and his unwavering vision of creating a more compassionate and just world. I discovered Michael and his work at a critical period in my life, while in the middle of my studies at university. Listening to the principles that Michael valued inspired me to reflect on what matters to me and what kind of impact I want to make in the world. Many of my actions in the past year were inspired by Michael. It was Michael who gave me the courage to speak up in class about issues I wouldn't have been brave enough to speak on before. It was Michael who moved me to become involved in community organizing and volunteering to help organizations with missions I'm passionate about. If I had not found Michael, I likely wouldn't have acted on my values in these ways. Because of Michael, I've also been grateful to discover an amazing community of people who've all been deeply impacted by him and who want to keep his legacy alive. I'm a proud member of the TNVS family. Since finding Michael, I've tuned into many of the channel's live streams, which has allowed me to hear from inspiring voices like Leisha, David, Matt, Joshua, Milton, Jeremy, and so many others. Each time it's clear to me how much Michael's spirit and love radiates to the community that he built. I find myself admiring Michael even more every time I learn how he's touched people's lives. The kindness and care that he gave to every individual he crossed paths with. I truly believe that Michael's impact on me has changed the trajectory of my life. Whenever I have the courage to stand up for what I believe in and try to make a change, however small it may seem, Michael will be inseparable from all of it. I want to help build the world that Michael envisioned. You are deeply missed by so many, Michael. I hope you're doing well wherever you are right now, and I hope that we can make you proud one day. Thank you.
thinking about this cosmopolitan socialist idea, which I wrote about in Against the Web. What's interesting in that was I, I, I think that that model is definitely the one we need. I really do think that it's the answer to the reactionary forces that defend uh, various historically contingent hierarchies. Um, I think it's an answer, a dynamic answer to the resurgence of things like nationalism, which has obviously been very prevalent right now. There's a breakdown in the global system and there's a breakdown of worldviews um, that is facilitating a lot of moves on the right. And it's also facilitating some moves on the actual left and some moves in the more sort of neoliberal discursive lane. And, um, and, and all of the toxicities and, and excesses that go along with things like white fragility book and this type of stuff. And all I was doing with this cosmopolitan socialist idea was really to just try to say, there is kind of a couple, a couple of basic blocks of how to look at the world. And one is that, and it's funny because you could, they flip it either way. The traditional chauvinist, bigoted, imperial, settler, colonialist way is to say that there is a Western tradition. West is best. West has given us all of the good things. And other cultures either have to catch up or they can't. It's all some version of racism and paternalism built out of imperial and colonialist narratives. Now, there's this kind of countervailing force, actually, which sort of you know, goes beyond the correct historical understanding of uh, European imperialism, U.S. hegemony, and all these structures arising from capital and labor and race uh, to just saying like, no, actually, like the West is intrinsically evil. And all of this, you know, instead of it's the best, it's the worst. And the cosmopolitan model, what it really does is it says... And, oh, and then the, the second model is, is really to say, like, all cultures are distinct and different and never shall they really meet. They're on different trajectories. And what's interesting is that there's right and left versions of all of these arguments. Or I should say some people on the, I, I think ultimately either chauvinism or essentialism of any culture or complete um, saying that there isn't. Uh, global and cosmopolitan overlap. I think those are all fundamentally reactionary arguments, but sometimes you'll see them manifest in different guises. What the cosmopolitanism argument says in a really simple and basic way, and you could see this from all of the greats, whether we're talking about, you know, Amartya Sen or Cornel West, is that basically that like there is shared human desires, there is shared universal traits. Most all human beings really want the same things, there's a shared global human experience, but then there's also a variety of different contexts and ways of discoursing about those experiences and how to get there. So human rights are universal, uh, which is a rejection of both the nationalistic and culturally particular views. Every human being wants some sets of basic protections uh, and, and economic abundance and speech and assembly and so on. But then how that manifests looks very different. And there's uh, different traditions that have discoursed on rights in different ways. There's a great book by Amartya Sen called The Argumentative Indian, where he talks about how, as an example, the Indian tradition has multiple flowing uh, sources for arguments in favor of democratic and open and economically just societies. And so I think that this cosmopolitanism with a ground in materialist politics and Marxist analysis of the economic base is where it is, is where it's the best way to go about things. We're in a global society, we're in a deeply interconnected one. We have to overcome all sorts of legacies of division, abuse, and oppression, but we also have to create cohesion, integration, and actually build models for things that are better. And part of how we do that is by really genuinely recognizing the global interconnectedness of everybody and really deeply reading from and going in between different traditions and synthesizing them, looking for synthesis, looking for points of reference. I think Amilcar Cabral has more to teach us about 2020 in the United States 
than almost anybody who's writing about 2020 in the United States. So this is my perspective. And, and the reason I want to bring in integral theory or some of the ideas around something called metamodernism, and I would check out Jeremy Johnson and Brent Cooper and Michelle Bowens with Peer to Peer Foundation. And this is like where, you know, it gets trickier. I've been kind of saying like, look, I, you know, spiritual, for lack of a better word, element to this. To get to this cosmopolitan socialist vantage point and to really develop the sort of empathy, the patience, the capacity at synthesis, and also complexity and nuance. This is not another moralistic story. We have competing social media driven just versions of mega stupidity right now that preach pure, you know, black or white binary narratives that don't have any room for human complexity, historical complexity, and rigor. You read Adolf Reed in class notes, that's the Adolf Reed reference. He really identified that. The delusion and moralism in the left that is only accelerated with woke culture. This is a model that is about like, what does it actually mean to be truly global to the extent we can, local, national, and international simultaneously, east, west, north, south, but from a place of actual growth and empathy. And this is where, again, this questions of consciousness come in. The questions of cultivating empathy, cultivating compassion, cultivating awareness, the complete antithesis of social media modes, long-term thinking, compassion, seeing complexity, comfort with oneself, solitude, the opposite of instant gratification, the attempt to constantly humanize and not dehumanize your fellow humans. These are all completely countervailing forces to the market technologic that subsumes all of us today. Integral theory, which is something that a lot of, you know, it covers a lot of uh, people. Sri Aurobindo was a great Indian integral theorist. William Irwin Thompson was a fascinating public intellectual. The most well-known guy is probably a guy named Ken Wilber, who I'll tell you, uh, in my opinion, has some, you know, he's, when it comes to things like politics, policy, history, the guy, this is not the guy, I'll be very diplomatic, it's just not his strong suit. He's not uh, informed or up on that stuff, and it affects his analysis. But this model has definitely created some brilliant maps of integrating worldviews, which we really need to do. We need to have a much greater understanding of both how other people are seeing, experiencing, and then enacting in the world. This is a necessity. It's a necessity with all of the extraordinary splits in the United States and the kind of serious analysis we need to figure out even the different types of ruling class right now in this society. And it also is gonna be very necessary as the United States declines, relatively speaking. That's one of the things you know that shows up in the China coverage on the show. Of course, we need to talk about the crisis dealing, uh, you know, and the horrific repression of the Uyghurs as an example. And I care quite a bit about the Tibetan uh, oppression as well. But we also need to understand literally the Chinese worldview to the extent we can. We need to understand these things, not in and and, and in a bipartisan way. Well beyond that boring word in the United States, not in that milk toast centrist. We all just figured out and meet in some crappy middle, but literally that we need to humanize as many as possible and then try to create cohesion to enact real systems change. Because right now you see so much of these velocity of serious social action in the United States. I mean, they still were, we're still hugely behind. There isn't the countervailing force of labor to capital. These uprisings are extraordinary. Where are they going? In some good directions, but also the new boon and the toxic, horrifying, grotesque HR industry, the diversity consulting scam, which is often just companies covering their asses from discrimination lawsuits they should face with very little empirical basis in the research. And then of course, a renewal and another cycle of the horrifying toxicity of online culture. So we need to get of humanization, understanding and synthesis. 
And ultimately, my frame is that cosmopolitan socialist frame. That's what I'm most excited about. But the integral frame, what it does is it has, among other things, a quadrant model, which I think is fascinating. I'll just explain it to that. And this is the book. It's, uh, it's not a great, I mean, it's a good book. It's got some good theory. It's very dated in other ways, but it's got some good outlines here. It's called The Theory of Everything by Ken Wilber. The quadrants map different views of the world. What you have on the right side is objective systems and on the left side, subjective systems. And then you have uh, at the base, uh, social and at the uh, top, individual. I could be actually mixing those up. So in other words, let's take it, you know, really clearly. You're an individual, you're dealing with something like depression, uh, which familiar with. There could be subjective and objective components of it. Maybe you're, you know, maybe there's something happening with you physiologically, you address it that way. But then there's also deep questions of your life and meaning and how you feel and how you treat others and how you're treated. And those are the subjective realms, they both matter. Social systems. There's objective systems. There's objective systems. That this is the way we move currency. This is how technology works. This is how economy works. But then there's always cultural stories that correlate with them, right? This is, again, we go back historically. We look at the rise of the taxonomy of European racism and white supremacy. It correlates. There's the expansion of, Europe, of colonialism and imperialism. And, and then those cultures manifest taxonomies of other human beings and stories and narratives, religious and quote unquote scientific, to justify racism. You see, those things are working in the objective and subjective realms. And, in, and so what he does is he kind of shows you that a lot of different worldviews they all can have validity, but they're usually coming from one of these different viewpoints. A lot of people will say like, okay, the main source of the action is individual subjectivity, right? The main source of the action is individual objectivity. The main source of the action is social materiality, or the main source of the action is uh, cultural stories and myths. And the answer from Wilbur, and the answer actually, if you read Gramsci in a certain way, is integral, and then it's all. It's all of the above. And then we start to have this perspective of wanting to have some flexibility in how we look at things and, and, and a deep tolerance, like the tolerance that someone like a Pepe Mojica talks about. Not a kind of, you know, yeah, well, you just got to tolerate everybody. It's, it's, it's deeper. Because like also ultimately you do. It's another dynamic. <laughs> tolerate everything. You have battles in politics, but you 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 want to understand the engine of different worldviews and in that mix he's including and meta modernism in certain ways points to this and certainly you know jeremy johnson the contemplative work and at its best some connection to a spiritual practice or any type of conscientious cultivation of empathy now we're all trying and we're all failing. That's the point. That also cultivates the self-compassion. Is going to give us some of the capacity to have some of the sort of flexibility of mind and emotions to move in between worldviews, pivot in between them, and start to create some of that synthesis. That sort of real range of empathy and intellect. So I hope this made some sense, guys. I'm using these things to, you know, formulate the stuff that I'm really thinking about for like future books and just stuff that I care about and want to share something that uh, is, is, is important to me. I'm not, you know, I'm not into the whole quackery, whatever. I mean, I, I have plenty, plenty of criticisms of, of Wilbur, but let, let, that's actually exactly what I'm talking about. Even just that, like that you can... That work cannot just be reduced to like the online quack library or whatever. We gotta figure out how to think through things in a much more nuanced way and see human beings, particularly at an individual level, in a much more nuanced way. Acceptance doesn't mean that you're not making distinctions. I'll wrap this up and I will wish each and every one of you all my very best. Please treat yourselves well, treat each other better, treat each other well. Uh, treat yourself better, um, and 
and uh, log off if you can. Much love to all of you. Stay safe, stay strong, be well. Much love, people.